Welcome, Voyagers. Lesson 23. Come on around, Kate. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to give you the secret sign for Voyagers. Please make it back wherever you are. Family reunion, classroom, prayer group, athletic field, bar, home, rest home, peace, joy, love. Do it again. Peace, joy, love. Peace, really pulling joy, love is everywhere. One last time. Peace, joy, love. Okay. If you'll man the mighty mini cam. Kate has no experience in video production. Never took a course, never read a book. She knows nothing about it. <laughs> we just have our little camera. Come on around, pick me up here. Our theme today is beloved pets, beloved pets. This is an interpersonal cosmos for Homo sapiens. I can't speak for any other species. There's a qualitative difference between all the species who have ever evolved and Homo sapiens who we believe were specially created as well as the evolution of all species. But Homo sapiens are created in the image of God for communication and human, uh, communion with God and with each other. And with the animals and plants and the ecology and the cosmos and the stars and the black holes. So we don't want loneliness Depression, isolation, narcissism, cut-offness. Soren Kierkegaard, a Christian existential philosopher, read his books, called it a condition he called a long time ago, shut-offness. We don't want people to be isolated as islands unto themselves. That's bad psychology, bad spirituality, bad physical health, and bad outcome to life. We want interactivity, connectivity, energy, communication, talking, speaking, hugging, acting, interneting, all the beautiful social media. And we want companions where we live, our apartment, our condo, our shelter, our mansion, our palace, wherever it is, our boat. We want companions. So dogs and cats, God's gift to humanity of companionate, domesticated friends. And they're wonderful. He invests them with a certain degree of personality. They do not have the neocortex of the human being. That is a special creation. You're a special creation in the whole cosmos. And there'll never be another you or me. But cats and dogs are a near second. Lively, they have emotions, they have wills, they're intelligent, they perceive. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of companion live organic pets. A few years ago, sometime back, we were in constrained financial limited funds as many people can find themselves in today's world. We had to live in motels for a season. So we lived in this motel for a week. It had a community. A number of people were living there. And I met one person at a barbecue and she talked to me and said, Dr. Dan, 
I had a stroke 11 years ago and I lost part of my mental and physical capability. But I came here and I came to this motel and all these friends here today love me. But I have made it one day at a time because of Precious. Precious gets me through. She was a kitten, now she's 11 years old. Precious loves me and I love her and I talk to her every day. So it's like Nazi girl. She showed me photos of Precious. Love and companionship. An organic pet who loved her back with intelligence and faithfulness and loyalty and fidelity. They confided in each other. They had an ongoing conversation all these 11 years that kept her mentally healthy and intact and gave her courage to enter the community and have a social network and do well enough to get along. Now, companions don't have to be dogs and cats. They can be lizards. We have friends who love their turtles, have had them for years. They raised turtles. As a boy, I raised a tarantula. Preschool. My dad brought it home, found it on the road, carried the tarantula. I loved him. Could be a snake, could be a goldfish, or as I found from my second grade teacher, I went around the street, found where she lived. I, I loved her. She taught me so much in the second grade. Mrs. Scully. Thank you, Mrs. Scully. She invited me into her home and she had a goldfish bowl of snails. And she loved them and she talked to them and she fed them lettuce. So I, second grader, asked my parents and got a goldfish bowl and put snails and I fed my snails for one to two years. I don't know, a long time. They were my beloved friends. I talked to them, they talked to me. Don't you talk to your dog or cat? How you doing? Oh, come on, let's play. Roll over. How's your day? Oh, I love you. Let's go. Here's your toy. Do you want to play? And you hear them, don't you? Their eyes, their manners. Don't they interact with you? Now, iguanas, no. But dogs and cats, yes. So, I'm gonna tell you about a pet I had, Wolfie, Abyssinian cat. This is before Kate and I. I bred out of Abyssinians, Wolfie. I raised him from birth. I would swing him as he grew and he loved, he was so relaxed. He would swing through the air. I never tricked him, trapped him, startled him. No, I wanted loyalty and faithfulness and trust in me. And boy, did he love me. I'll tell you how much. So Wolfie was now grown, intelligent. Abyssinians were bred by pharaohs in Egypt to keep palaces clean of rodents. So they have a killing bite. They can extend their jaw and they make a clicking sound. It dislocates so that they can swoop out and grab a snake by the throat or a mouse and have a killing bite. Well, I also was raising finches, so I had a finch. One day I was feeding him and he got out. So now I have a finch in a cathedral-like condo room. So here's the finch. Wolfie knew I was in trouble. He figured I was stressed. I can't catch a finch. He got on an armchair. I didn't even notice. And he began swaying. He was doing calculus. Can you imagine three-dimensional calculus in a cat's mind? Because he loves me. Suddenly, he leapt many feet in the air, got the finch in the air with a killing bite, 
came down and landed gently, as cats can do. And then I said, Wolfie, please give the finch to Daddy. Daddy loves the finch. Please don't break his neck. And Wolfie said, it's the only time I ever heard him growl. He wasn't so sure about that deal. He really wanted to eat the finch. I had seen him eat mice before. He wanted to do so bad. Behavioral chain. Oh, yes. But he loved me. And he perceived. And do you know what he did? He growled, but then he looked up with those deep golden eyes. And he said, well, but in his body language, he stepped forward and leaned into me. And I reached down and got the finch and he released his killing bite and gave me the finch and I put him back in the cage. He was just fine. And I gave Wolfie extra tuna, which he loved that day. So, pets. Now, some of us don't have that option <clears throat> as we age or we have allergies. Kate, what happens to you in the presence of dogs and cats? Sneeze time. <laughs> right away, within the minutes, eyes water, turn red. What happens in your breathing? Oh, it gets all <clears throat> husky and choked. I'm sneezing, I'm coughing. Not good. So, we can't have pets. I gave them up forever. Organic ones. But, the Lord always has a way. I love pets. Here's our pets, our beloved friends you just met. Nazi girl. Darling. You already know Lionheart. Tigger. Put up your dukes. Put up your dukes. He likes combat and fighting, but he's also peaceful. Winnie the Pooh. Hi, everybody. And Nasi. Hello. Now, can stuffed animals communicate interpersonally? Well, no, they're stuffed animals, but they're also quantum energy. They're made of quarks and photons, wave particles, just like us. It's identical down in the subatomic level. So we can project onto them an interpersonal conversation because the universe is relational. I'll give you an example. Now, Nasi, you don't normally say much of anything, anytime, but I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think of Einstein's theory of relativity? Can you tell our voyagers? I think that he had it three quarters right. Space, time, matter, energy, yes. But Dr. Dan, he missed a fourth property of the cosmos that he didn't believe in and didn't know and didn't experience that I call relationality. Relationality. Space, time, matter, and relationality. And you write about it in the epilogue of your book, Faith Beyond Church Walls. You write about Einstein, and I believe what you say. It's true. Wow. Who could anticipate that from a stuffed animal? Well, I just wanted to contribute. Hi, Voyagers. Bye. Okay. Moving forward. I've got to change glasses because I'm an advanced senior. And I've got to see my production notes. And now, I want to play a song done by the Brass Arts Quintet, Polar Express. Believe, believe. If you believe, all things are possible. Support these artists. Look them up, buy their songs. 
I love artists. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Pets are our imaginary friends. Every little girl, every little boy has imaginary fireman friends, doggy friends, teddy bear friends. They talk to them. Why do we lose that wondrous quality? Because we mature and grow up and become rational. Bad mistake. We need to stay children at heart through adulthood into old age. That's my prescription as a doctor of psychology and a philosopher and a theologian. Awaken your inner child. Keep the capacity for fantasy and role play. Pretend, friends. You can feel playful, see their intelligence, interact with them in your condo, your apartment, your rest home. Everybody kind of need a Winnie the Pooh somewhere around? Have you ever thought of that? The alternative, being isolated, alone in your bed. Not a pretty picture. Bring in Winnie the Pooh. And you'll get a kiss a day and some honey. Yes, Dr. Den. I like to give honey. So, pretend friends is a mentally healthy, good thing. It keeps us from the horror of isolation and loneliness. Build our interpersonal skills, keeps our brain firing alive into old age. Can be your goldfish, whoever, your parrot. I'm thinking of people I actually know. Or your plant. They're precious if you believe. It's pretend, but your unconscious will impart a surplus reality and create a dialogue of relationality. Oh, here we go. You didn't see this coming. Kate, anchor the video. Now we enter the world of the wondrous Andrew Lloyd Webber. And we're gonna do a tribute to cats. Are you blind when you're born? Can you see in the dark? Can you look at a king? Would you sit on his throne? Can you say of your bite that it's worse than your bark? Are you cut off the walk? When you're walking along, because jellicles are and jellicles do, jellicles do and jellicles would, jellicles would and jellicles can, jellicles can and jellicles do. I can't when you fall on the head, do you? We can balance our bars, we can 
Thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. <laughs> we haven't ever done that before. This is the theater of spontaneity. <laughs> I gotta readjust my head pad. <laughs> I could <can> barely see. <laughs> Okay, now, onward to self-defense. What would be a life lesson with Dr. Dan and Kate Montgomery hip-hop, martial arts and love without some martial arts? Okay, an assailant comes. Steps in with a kick, a punch, or a grab, or a choke. I don't care. My first move from my keto. Isn't that simple? I get off the line. The energy comes past. Or it looks like it is, but I have a counter. Oh! Ooh! You've been hit in the stomach. Oh! Can knock the air out of you and end everything. But what will that hit end everything is if I hit in the solar plexus. Because you could be a Mr. Olympus muscles, but you could never. There are no muscles here. The solar plexus is a hollow space. No muscles. You can't work it out with weights. It will always be vulnerable to these two knuckles. Uh! Uh! Two knuckles, solar plexus, lights out, everything's over, all done. But, let's say I miss, whatever. So, ooh, I have more in store. The person is assaulting me, reaching out, trying to grab, trying to recover, trying to move like a bull rush. I help them, but I catch them in a mouse trap. I grew up with mice in Northern New Mexico in our apartment where we lived. Oh, I could see five a night. Little gray mice. Whoa. So we set out mass mouse traps through elementary school and caught them. Bam! So here's a move. A mouse trap. Now, I am gonna let go, but I'm gonna transform. I'm a transformer. You've seen those movies? Now I'm an octopus. I reach with a tentacle. This becomes a sucker. To grab the neck, the cheek, and draw into me. And this becomes the octopus beak. Sharp. It's gonna strike the groin. So I draw in. Oh! But I'm not done yet. One foot motion. Ah! Octopus. Beak. Now I do a little shift in motion. I always like to get off the line. That's it. And I raise the Ferris wheel for a strike out of the sky. A drone strike, elbow, whatever's there, head, forehead, temple, neck, whatever. So, kind of looks like this.
and then I run away. I run away. One more time. Okay, Voyagers, we love you. Peace, joy, love. See you next time. <laughs>